The Origins of Proto-Afro-Asiatics. So we'll begin from Shem to Israel. This is part one of a video series. So in order to know who the ancient Hebrews of Israel are, we must understand who were their ancestors according to the scriptures. The Israelites were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But who were the ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? According to the Hebrew text, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ancient ancestor was a man named Shem. If you read Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 through 26, it says, This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. After he begot Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. So from 10 to 26, it reads, Arphaxad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serg, Nahor. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abraham. So from the lineage, starting with Jacob to Israel, from Jacob to Isaac, to Abraham, going from Abraham back to Shem, we see that this lineage is very specific and male-oriented. The Israelites basically are a Semitic people because they descend from Shem. According to outside sources or according to the academic understanding of the Israelites, they are also Semitic. The Israelites were a confederation of Iron Age of Semitic speaking tribes of the ancient Near East. The Hebrew people are most are mostly taken as synonymous with Semitic speaking Israelites. So historically the Israelites also spoke a Semitic language called Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew script is the name used by modern scholars to describe the script found in Canaan. Uh, Canaanite inscriptions from the region of Biblical Israel and Judea. Proto-Sinaitic, the North Semitic alphabet, is considered the earliest trace of alphabet, alphabetic writing and the common ancestor of both the ancient South Arabian script and the Phoenician alphabet, which led to many modern alphabets, including the Greek alphabet. And so here is an example of the proto sinaitic and Paleo-Hebrew. This is sort of like a timeline going backwards from where these scripts and languages come from. Paleo-Hebrew to Phoenician alphabet to proto sinaitic script to even the Egyptian holographics. And here is a visual map showing from Paleo-Hebrew to Canaanite to Northwest Semitic to Central Semitic to Western Semitic and Proto-Semitic. So the Hebrew language also goes back to Proto-Semites, Proto-Semitic tongue. So the Israelites are ethnically a Semitic people because they descend from Shem. The Israelites are also linguistically Semitic because they descend from Shem. So the ancestors of the Israelites are Semites. Now one important factor about the Semitic language is that it's part of the Afro-Asiatic language family. Afro-Asiatic, of relating to or being a family of languages widely distributed over southwestern Asia and Africa, including the Semitic. And then Semitic, of relating to or consisting of a, family, a subfamily of the Afro-Asiatic language family that includes languages such as Hebrew. Afro-Asiatic, also called Afrasan languages, formerly Hemeto-Semitic or Semeto-Hemetic languages of common origin found in the northern part of Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and some islands in adjacent areas in Western Asia. So here's a map of the Afro-Asiatic languages, and it is spread across the Middle East and in Africa. So, with that being said, Israelites are an Afro-Asiatic Semitic people.
Therefore, we should look into the origins of Semitic and Afro-Asiatic. First, we'll take an academic approach to the birth of the Semitic and Afro-Asiatics. Uh, then we'll take a biblical approach, which will be in the next video, part two. But since we're taking an academic approach, we'll dive into genetics as well. The main genetic term we need to understand is a haplogroup, which I done a video on. You can refer back to that video for more information, but I'll give a quick breakdown right now of what a haplogroup is. So a haplogroup is a genetic population group of people who share a common ancestor on either their paternal or maternal line. Particular haplogroups are associated with well-known ancestral groups such as the Vikings, or Aboriginal Australians, and Celts. By the way, this is from Living DNA. What are haplogroups? Living DNA explain. So a maternal haplogroup. A maternal haplogroups from the mother are determined by assessing mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA. This also means that you will have the same maternal haplogroup as anyone else in your direct maternal line. Your mom, brother, sister, aunt, and grandmother on your mother's side follow that follow that haplogroup back to its origin, and you'll find a single mutation occurred at some point in history. So to simplify this, a mitochondrial haplogroup is passed down from mother to daughter, mother to daughter, mother to daughter, but uh, the son can also have it. A man can have uh, a maternal haplogroup as well because men carry both the X and Y chromosome. Now, what are paternal haplogroups? The paternal haplogroup relates to your Y chromosome, and since that is the sex-determining chromosome for men, it is passed down from father to son. Also, women don't have a Y chromosome. They will not have a paternal haplogroup by default. However, they are able to find out what their paternal haplogroup is if a male relative from the father's side, ideally a brother, father, uncle, or grandfather, is also tested. So to simplify this, uh, the, the Y chromosome is passed down from father to son, father to son, father to son. And women do not carry this Y chromosome. But if a woman wants to know the male lineage of her male relatives, the men will have to take it, such as a brother and an uncle and father. And the only reason women don't carry uh, the Y chromosome is because, of course, they can't carry both chromosomes like men. Men are both X and Y, and women can't do this. So that is why. And so to conclude, just keep in mind these terms. Y DNA is paternal DNA. It's male. And then MT DNA is maternal DNA. That's female. And the men, as I said earlier, can carry both the paternal and the maternal, whereas women can only carry the uh, maternal. So here is a visual representation of this. This is from ISOGG Wiki, and it says a haplogroup is a genetic population group of people who share a common ancestor on the paternal line and the maternal line. So have this as a representation of yourself, you having your father's paternal or Y DNA, and then your mother's maternal line. This would be if you was a man, you'll carry both, but if you was a female, you'll only carry the mother. Here's another visual representation of this. Let's say you, uh, a, a man and a woman have a child, two children, a son and a daughter. And uh, so the son will carry both the father's Y DNA and the mother's maternal DNA represented in blue. And the sister will carry only the maternal DNA represented in red. So also haplogroups can be used to trace migrations, common descent, and ethnic origins. This is from what is a haplogroup and what can it tell you about your family tree. This is from ancestralfindings.com and it reads, it is it, it, it at at its essence, a haplogroup is an ancestral clan. Some clans are the Vikings, Native Americans, all tribes, Celts, Aboriginal Australians, and other such groups. Your haplogroup tells you where your ancestors came from deep back in time. There are also male and female haplogroups, so you can see where your male and where your male 
and female sides of the family originated back in prehistoric times. As you, as with, as with Y DNA, which traces the male line from father to son, and maternal DNA, which traces the female line from mother to daughter, haplogroups also follow straight male and female descendancy lines. And here's a map to the uh, to the right, basically representing haplogroups and people groups, like R1B being ancestral Eurasian clade, or haplogroup I1 being a North Proto-European clade. So here is haplogroups of the world. Every human being, every Homo sapiens sapien has a haplogroup, and here is basically just the distribution of these haplogroups throughout the world. So, linguists and geneticists commonly use haplogroups to find the genetic and linguistic origins and migrations of ancient ethnic populations. This is why it's important to know about haplogroups when studying the origins of Semitic and Afro-Asiatic. With that being said, let's begin. So, the origins of Afro-Asiatic and Semitic people. What are the genetic, linguistic, and ethnic origins of Semites and Afroasiatic? Another theory for the origin of Semites and Afroasiatic is the Eastern Sahara, or also known as the Nile Valley slash Red Sea region. So let's look at the Eastern Saharan origin of Afroasiatics. So again, we're going back to this study called Why Haplogroups. Uh, why, uh, yes, why haplogroups, archaeological cultures, and language families, a review of the probability of multidisciplinary uh, comparisons using the case of E-M35 by Andrew Langsker. So it reads, there are several, several relatively uncontroversial um, proposals concerning the ancient movements of Afro-Asiatic languages, each of which we can we can immediately compare to haplogroup E-M35 and its subclades in, in population genetics. Both E-M35 male lineages on the one hand and Afro-Asiatic languages on the other are seen by specialists in the two respective fields as having moved prehistorically within the Cruceni a 2007 study refers to a bi-directional corridor along the now and slash or the western coast of the Red Sea. From the Sinai and Mediterranean to the Horn of Africa. Also, in both fields, the population who lived in this corridor has, obs has obvious ancient connections to the Near East Levantine Corridor, spreading to the Fertile Crescent, where such spread as EV13 and E-M34 may have their origins. Middle Eastern Semitic-speaking populations typically also have a smaller presence of E-M35 Eurasian lineages than most African uh, populations of Afroasiatic speakers, with an apparent with, with, with the apparent exception of Chetic. There is also, in both cases, a obvious connection to the western of the, to the west of the Nile in the direction of the Sahara and along the southern Mediterranean in the Maghreb. The people there are strongly associated with the distinct E-M81 and E-V65 sub, subclades of E-M35 and the Berber branch of Afro-Asiatic languages. In both population genetics and linguists, the, uh, the Levant branch re-entered Africa in historical periods, both in Egypt, which is now Arabic speaking, but was once home to the Egyptian language, and Ethiopia, where Semitic, South Semitic languages now dominate in some areas which are believed to have once been Cushetic speaking. In addition, uh, in, indeed, there must have been much back and forth uh, movements 
at these two points of contact between Africa and Asia. Of course, when we find such similar patterns in both languages and Y lineages, this can give us at least some confidence that the two population movements cause both patterns. With this in mind, it is, it is proposed that we must at least assume a strong likelihood that E-M35 male lineages were involved in at least many of the migrations and cultural transmissions which cause the present and historical distributions of the Afro-Asiatic languages. So basically they're saying that Haptic Group E and Afro-Asiatic perfectly overlap each other when it comes to population movement, and this is quite important. So here is a visual representation of this, the Eastern Sahara popping up uh, Afro-Sans or Afro-Asiatic peoples, and here is the genetic representation of Haptic Group E originating in this region of the Afro-Asiatic homeland of proto-Semitic languages. Here's a book called In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory by John D. Bingston, who actually covers this as well. He says, the overall pattern is consistent with a model of the first, first speakers of Afro-Asiatic having emerged in or near the Horn of Africa, which we covered earlier, or in the now Valley. A pre, early pre-proto-Semitic speakers would have migrated into Syrio Palestine before the Neolithic, being taken by uh, taken there by M35 bearers, specifically M35/78, and adopted by populations bearing M89 lineages. So here is a visual representation again of the Afro-Asiatic homeland near the Nile River or Eastern Sahara. And here's a visual representation of the spread of haplogroup E from the Nile Valley or the Eastern Sahara. And this includes Semites. Here is a perfect study that covers the link between haplogroup E and Afro-Asiatic. It's called why chromosome E haplogroups, their distribution and implication to the origin of Afro-Asiatic languages and pastoralism. So it says, most Y chromosome haplogroup diversity in Africa, however, is present within micro haplogroup E that seems to have appeared 21,000 through 32,000 years ago, somewhere between the Red Sea and Lake Chad. The proto-Afro-Asiatic group carrying the E-P2 hap mutation may have appeared at this point in time and subsequently gave rise to the different major population groups, including current speakers of the Afro-Asiatic languages and pastoralist populations. So here is P2 or E-P2, and here are all the lineages that descend from it, such as M215 and V38. So right here it reads, a branching in the network may once again represent an episode of human migration that carried the haplogroup E-M35 and its sub-haplogroups sub further to the western coast of the Red Sea, to Yemen, Oman, and Saudi Arabia, and, and concurrently down to southern Africa as part of a more recent Y chromosome motivated out of Africa migration episode. The PCA and MDS display similar interesting groupings of the Afro of the Afar and Shio populations of Eritrea with their Near Eastern Arabian populations to conjure up on the genetic relationship of the two sides of the Red Sea. The arrival of the E-M35 and derived subclades, for example, E-M123 slash E-M34 to Arabia, appear to be strongly linked to expansion into East Africa, North Africa, Europe, Southern Africa, and an event that is likely related to pastoralism, hastened by its event and uh, L and um, amendable 
for analysis and dating using, usually using approaches similar to what was proposed for the co-migration of Y chromosome and disease traits. Although most of the data set in our study defined the deep ancestry of the phenology, of phyology, they still shed some important some, they still shed some information to our interpretation of recent phenomena such as the current genetic diversity, the haplogroup E, that E haplogroup in an implication to the origin and spread of Afroasiatic languages and to the history of pastoralism. Moreover, more comparative genetic analysis between the two sides of the Red Sea especially emphasizing on E-M123 slash E-M35 or E-M78 haplogroups will not only redefine the route of, of exit of Homo sapiens sapiens from East Africa, but also the genealogies of Afro-Asiatic languages in the region. So basically all this is saying is that haplogroup E likely has its origin near the Red Sea, spreading basically both sides of the Red Sea, and Afroasiatics basically have the exact same type of route and origin. Now here's a study called Complex Genetic History of East Africa Human Populations. Over here I have it in a block of red, and it has down here what I underlined in yellow for B and E proto-Semitic. And so for the B section and the E, it has haplogroup E Basically, basically being the haplogroup of these proto-Semitic populations originating in the Eastern Sahara or the Nile Valley or near the Red Sea. And again, they're saying proto-Semitic would be E, haplogroup E. Here's a visual representation of this again, Afroasiatic homeland of proto-Semitic languages and with, you know, haplogroup E being the base population. And here is the north Afroasiatic heartland and Semites popping out, leaving the uh, Red Sea region or the Nile Valley going into the Levant. Here is a website that goes into this again called Haplogroup E1B1B Y DNA by EUpedia, and it says the Red Sea origins and Neolithic expansion. Haplogroup E1B1B, formerly known as E3B, represents the last major direct migration from Africa to Europe. E1B1B lineages are closely linked to the diffusion of Afro-Asiatic languages. So here is a, a chart showing the Paleolithic Red Sea region where haplogroup E would have originated from. And here is a map showing the Proto-Afro-Asiatics popping out and leaving the region of the Red Sea going all throughout Africa and the Middle East, the spread of Afro-Asiatic languages, which includes Semitic. And here is a representation again, both of language and DNA and the spread of these peoples. Yet again, we're met with the idea that haplogroup E is the lineage of early Afro-Asiatic and Semitic populations. But this time, the haplogroup would have originated near the Red Sea region of the Eastern Sahara. Now, how would these early Afro-Asiatic and Semites look? I believe the North Ethiopic phenotype is the best. Commonly common among the Red Sea coast, like we're talking about, and the Nile Valley, from Egypt to Eritrea, and deep into the Ethiopian highlands, often blend with Arabs and Yemenids, that arrived in prehistoric times, sometimes in Arabia as well. Dark, sometimes medium, bronze, brown skin, tight, curly hair. So this is probably another good uh, example of what a proto-Semite would look like or a proto-Afro-Asiatic. And here's their distribution and homeland. Conclusion. The ancestors of the Israelites, you know, Afro-Asiatic Semitic people, could have emerged from the Eastern Sahara. Therefore, their Y DNA likely would be haplogroup E according to the study, studies we just covered, and their phenotype would likely be Eastern Saharan, just like uh, what we see when it comes to these ancient people in prehistoric times. And here is a representation of everything we covered just on one slide. 
uh, haplogroup E being the ancestor of Afroasiatics popping up near the Red Sea. Here's the phenotype of what these early Afroasiatics and Semites would look. And here below is the representation of the spread of Proto-Afroasiatics. And here's the genetic spread of Proto-Afroasiatics. So we conclude with this study, the origins of Proto-Afroasiatics. And returning back to the main point, as I said, if the Israelites are a Semitic people, an Afro-Asiatic people, and if their ancestors are also a proto-Semitic people, then it is likely that they would be carriers of haplogroup E, both their ancestors, their proto-Semitic ancestors, and the Israelites themselves. And I'm basing this on logic and on the studies we've read about the origins of Afro-Asiatics, proto-Semites, and haplogroup E. And I believe this is the best way to go about things when it comes to studying these people. And so, so far, this is what I am leaning towards when it comes to the Y chromosome, the Y DNA of the Israelites. It would be an E marker. And this is where we conclude. Hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. Leave a comment, like, and subscribe. And there will be more information and videos coming out soon. And we will have Q&As one day where you can ask me questions. And have a great day. Shalom.